He is the bread of life, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the true vine, the light of the world, the good shepherd, and the door. He is the resurrection and the life. He is I am. Well, good morning, North Point. How are we doing this morning? Doing okay? Good. Cool to see your faces. Uh, it's good to be back uh, after a little bit of a COVID stint for our family. Um, as you know, we're a family of seven, and there were often times in this last year that Michelle and I were like, how have we not gotten COVID? How have we not done this? And then it, it caught up with us. We did. We did get it. But uh, the family is doing, uh, we're doing well. Still got a couple that, because of all the rules, you know, the, the, the COVID things, they still have to quarantine. But Michelle and I are out, and uh, so I'm happy to be uh, back here, be with you. Thank you. Lots of you, you've prayed for us, and you've sent texts and, and cards, and we've got lots of food, um, which you you don't have to stop that if you don't want to, but no, again, it's been super nice. Thank you. Very grateful uh, for church supporting us and, and uh, getting us through this. I'm also very thankful for Pastor David, who was able to speak last week and cover uh, John chapter four uh, for us. And man, I, I'm especially grateful for David because um, David uh, grew up actually at this church uh, when it was Johnston Evangelical Free Church. And then he's been on staff with us for 12 years here. He's our longest running full-time staff member as a part of the church. And um, over that time, David has built a lot of relationships. He's done a lot of ministries, built a lot of ministries, and just gained a lot of experience, which has prepared him uh, for the next step of his journey. Um, David has accepted a call to become a senior pastor at Crossroads Community Fellowship in Victor, Montana. And uh, so uh, David and the entire Fluke family, we, we love them. We're super grateful uh, for them, and uh, they've been a part of, of this work here for a long time. And so we're sad to see them go, but also we're very excited for them and for for what God has for what God has for them. So we're going to be doing some special things for the Flugs in the month of March. Um, some celebrations and different ways to encourage them and send them off well. Uh, the big one will be on Sunday, March the 28th. That'll be their final Sunday with us. We'll recognize them in the service. We'll pray for them, and we're also going to do an open house after the third service. So, we'll <coughs> excuse me, COVID. <coughs> uh, we, uh, so we're going to do some special things for them, and uh, we want you to be a part of that day as well. In the meantime, um, be praying for them, encourage them, talk to them. Man, we just want to send them off all really, really well and show them how much we love them and we care for them. And they'll come back and visit. They'll be back with us. They have family in the area. They'll come back here, and they'll be with us some Sundays we know in the future as well. And uh, we're, uh, we're, we're happy uh, for them. Uh, today, what I want to do is I want to take another uh, look from a little different view of this story in John chapter 4 of Jesus with the woman at the well. So if you have your Bible or a device, take it and turn to John chapter four, if you would. Let me recap the story. We looked at it last week. So let me recap the story for you uh, quickly and then get to what we want to uh, talk about. Um, Jesus has been ministering in the southern part of Israel for a little while, up to this point in, in John's gospel. And if you know a little bit of the topography of Israel, um, this, is, this is it right here. If you don't, let me tell you. We've got the Sea of Galilee in the north of Israel. This is the Jordan River that runs between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, which is in the south. Off here to the uh, west is the Mediterranean Sea, just to get where we're at. Now, uh, at this time, uh, when Jesus is in uh, Israel, Israel is really broken up into a couple of parts. It's called Judea in the southern part, which is where Jerusalem is at, and in the north is Galilee. Um, Jesus is from Nazareth in Galilee, which is up here in the north. His base of operations for his ministry is actually Capernaum, which is in the north part of the Sea of Galilee. And he spends really the majority of his time up here in Galilee, but a, a number of uh, uh, special visits that he takes down to Judea and into Jerusalem. He's currently around Jerusalem, and he decides that he's going to go back up into Galilee. Now, there's something else about Israel at this time, which we saw last week, is that right in the middle of these two parts of Israel is uh, another part called Samaria. And Samaria, in Samaria live people that are a mixed race of people. And to the Jews, they were seen as ethnically and morally and religiously impure, and you didn't want to have anything to do with them. So if you've watched the Harry Potter movies or read the novels, these are, the Samaritans are Mudbloods, right? They're like from muggle families and they're just not pure Jews. They're not, they're not right with God. That's the way that they were viewed. And that's not right they were viewed that way, but that is how they were viewed. So if you were a good Jew, you would not travel through Samaria when you were going north to south or south to north. You would go around 
the Samaritan, ter- the Samaritan territory. It would take you longer, but it was worth it so you didn't have to see and interact with those people. Jesus, though, decides he's going straight through Samaria, right? And he ends up stopping at a place, a little town called Sychar. And at Sychar, outside of Sychar was a well that Jacob, one of the patriarchs of Israel, had built uh, hundreds of years before. He stops at the well. He sends the disciples, his followers, into the city to get some food because he has an appointment with somebody and he wants to be alone with her. Uh, The woman that he meets with doesn't know that she has an appointment with Jesus, but he is on her radar. And so as she comes to the well to gather water, Jesus is there by himself and he strikes up a conversation with her. Now, this woman that Jesus talks to was an outsider by like every definition of the word, certainly to Jews. Um, she, was a, she was a woman, she was a Samaritan, she was an immoral woman, and so you wouldn't have anything to do with a person like her. But not only was she an outsider to the Jews or to somebody uh, should be like Jesus, uh, but she was also an outcast in her own society. She came to the well in the middle of the day. Most of the women would come in the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening, not in the heat of the day by yourself unprotected. This woman had no friends and she is alone and she is by herself and Jesus strikes up a conversation with her. Um, She came to draw water and Jesus offers to give her living water to fully satisfy her. And so they have an exchange about um, why Jesus is even talking to her. They have an exchange about ethnicity and uh, social differences and religion and worship and even about her five husbands that she had had. Uh, Jesus was trying to show this woman that just like her coming here to the well to get physical water to satisfy herself physically, so her entire life had actually been lived that way that it was a picture of what her life was, trying to fill her life with temporary satisfactions, relationships with men that would never fully and ultimately satisfy her. And he's saying to her, I can give you something greater. I can fully satisfy you, completely fill you by giving you living water. Now look, um, this woman is a little picture into us uh, because every single person that's ever walked the face of this earth does the same thing that this woman was doing, right? We just do it in, in various ways, in different ways. We try to find fulfillment. Don't you want that in your life? I mean, don't you want to be satisfied and to be happy and to be fulfilled? And so for many of us, we find that through uh, jobs, uh, through career, through travel, through a uh, house or car, possessions, through video games, through relationships. There's all sorts of ways we try to do it, right? And so this woman might be an outsider, but she's also a little glimpse into us. And Jesus is saying to her, none of that is ever going to work for you. Let me give you living water. Let me give you something that will satisfy you forever, real full satisfaction. And even though Jesus pressed her, I mean, he did press her. He did confront her, right? I mean, he told her, I know you've had five husbands and the man you're with now is not even your husband. He's showing that he knows her fully. And he also showed her great love and offered her the way of true life. And she ends up believing in him. In fact, the change in her is so profound that the story tells us that she left her water pot there. What she actually even came to do, she's like, I don't care about that anymore. I gotta get back and I gotta tell everybody else about what has just happened to me. Jesus may just be the savior of the world. Now, David did a great job last week trying to show us uh, how to interact with outsiders just like Jesus did. That in our experience and in our, our local context for you and for me, there are, there are people that we do work with, uh, there's neighbors that we have, there's classmates that we have, there's people that we see in our communities uh, that we often are interacting with and, and how do we help share Jesus with them, right? How do we engage with them? We, we, we try to build a relationship with them and we try to get to the heart. You look them in the eye, you hear their questions, you, you, you get to know them, you let them talk, you really care about who they are and then you share the truth with them. Um, whenever we're gonna share Jesus with somebody, there's always gonna be a confrontation. Now, you don't have to be confrontational and you probably shouldn't, but there is a sense in which we're gonna confront worldviews and beliefs. Jesus does that with this woman, but he does it in a way that is loving and it is very relational. That's what David showed us last week. That in our local context, how do we constantly interact with people and help to share Jesus with them? Um, As a church, we try to do this. We have what we might even call local missions, right? And there's a number of ways here at North Point where we try to help you to be engaged with your neighbors and in our neighborhood and in our communities and with our schools and with local refugees and, uh, and, and a variety of opportunities that are like that in the local context. But one of the things that we see from Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry was how his mission was also global. Yes, local, yes, people right in front of us, but also people far from me. 
people different from me, different cultures, different languages, different regions of the world. And this is what I want us to see from Jesus today. I want us to see his global mission. Did you know that before Christianity came on the scene in, in world history, every single religion was tribal? All religions were the same in the sense that you were born into your religion and you didn't look to change your religion. Um, nobody was going to the library saying, I'm gonna study all the world religions and decide which version of God that I wanna believe in, which, which makes the most sense to me. Nobody did that. It was tribal, it was local, it was ethnic. You were born into it. And so the Greeks had their religion, right? Zeus and Athena, they're great gods. This is who you worship if you are Greek. Uh, if you are Roman, you had your gods. Jupiter and Venus, those are the gods you're born into. This is who you follow. It's a polytheistic, multiple God religion. If you were a Jew, you had a religion, you had Judaism, and you followed the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah given to us by Moses. You followed Yahweh God, you had a monotheistic religion. That's what you were into. And if you were born a Jew, that is the religion that you subscribe to. You didn't look to change it. You didn't look to follow a different religion. The Eastern peoples had their religions, Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism. All religions were local and they were ethnic and there was no such thing as evangelism. That wasn't a word that was even around. Nobody thought of doing that. You didn't try to convert people to your religion. It was just what you were born into. Now, sometimes a powerful kingdom would come into power. They would rise and they would impose their religion on those that they conquered. But that was typically with force, never with persuasion or their persuasive means were, were very persuasive. Like I'm gonna kill you if you don't convert to follow my religion. So religion was tribal and it was very much contained to your people group. Then Jesus comes, he claims to be fully God and he is fully human that wants all people to have a relationship with him. And his people are called to evangelize, to share with others this truth about Jesus and seek to win them over to this belief, not with force, but with persuasion, not with violence, but with love and with truth. See, Christianity was revolutionary in that nothing like it had ever been around before. Love your enemies, but also try to win them over. And in order to do that, you're gonna to have to confront them. You're gonna to have to show them that they are wrong and that Jesus has something better to offer. So from its inception, Christianity has had this ethic of love. Don't kill your enemies, love them, combined with a truth-speaking evangelistic focus, a multi-ethnic, for all people, as many people as possible focus. Now, this is seen most clearly in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts in the New Testament is like the history of the early church. It's our one book in the New Testament that's the history of the first century in Jesus's movement. At the very beginning of this book, Jesus has um, died, resurrected. He's about to ascend back up into heaven. And before he does that, he gathers his followers to himself. There's 120 people that follow Jesus, which is crazy. At the beginning, Jesus is about to leave. He's got 120 people. After his three years of ministry, death, resurrection, he gets these people together and he gives them this charge at the beginning of the book of Acts. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. In other words, Jesus is like, I am God and I'm the savior of the world and I'm about to peace out. Like I'm about to leave you, but I'm gonna send God, the Holy Spirit to live inside of you and you're gonna do greater things than I did. He told them that in John 14. You're gonna do greater things than I've done because God is gonna live inside of you with his power and then this is gonna happen. You will be my witnesses. You're gonna evangelize in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. Now, remember our map that we had up here of Israel? Jerusalem, local context, right? Uh, other Jews, people that live here in Jerusalem that you know, and then you're gonna go regional, that's local. Judea is regional, you're gonna spread out a little bit more. And then from there, you're gonna go to, you're not gonna like this one, Samaria, the mudbloods, you gotta go to them. You're gonna press beyond, uncomfortably so, to people that you don't wanna have anything to do with, that's where I want you to go to evangelize, to be witnesses to those people. And then by the way, let's just do this to the ends of the earth. You know, now, I kind of think it could have been like Rome, Greece, Spain, or something like that. He's like, no, let's just do the whole thing. I've said enough. We're just gonna go to everyone, multi-ethnic, complete, evangelize every single person in this world. Now, the rest of the book of Acts is that history of the followers of Jesus going Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth this loving, truth-speaking persuasion 
to try to bring all people into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus that from the beginning was not tribal, but it was purposefully multi-ethnic in scope. What I wanna show you today is that this was Jesus's mission from the very beginning. It's what he modeled to us. It wasn't an add-on. He didn't come up with this at the beginning of the book of Acts before he goes back up into heaven. It's the way that he started his ministry. Yes, local love and truth speaking in order to bring all people to God, but also global love and truth speaking in order to bring every single person in this world into a relationship with God. We see it in Jesus's interaction in John chapter four. And what I wanna show you, I just wanna look at this perspective from his story in John chapter four to see this truth, that we are called to pursue people across barriers through relationships and words. That's what Jesus shows us from his interaction with this woman at the well, that we are called to pursue people across barriers through relationships and words. This is what we call global missions. If you've ever wondered what global missions is, this is what global missions is. This is why we do global missions. It's what Jesus modeled for us. And there's three parts to this statement that we need to see. So let's just take them one at a time. The first is this, that we're called to pursue people. Just like Jesus, we're called to pursue people. Check out John chapter four and verse one, how this story begins. We read this. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. And then John, uh, who is writing this, actually adds a little tidbit. He says, although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. Um, I told you before the John, side note, that John who was writing this is very detail oriented. He wants to make sure he gets his evidence and his facts down. And so when he writes that the Pharisees heard Jesus was baptizing more disciples than John, he's like, I, I just gotta joke, I Jesus didn't actually baptize, it was his disciples who baptized. You might be like, well, I don't even know why that's important. I'm not 100% sure why it's important, either, even myself, except for the fact that John is very, very precise with what he writes, which will be important later on in the story. Verse three, so Jesus left Judea and he went back once more up north into Galilee. Now get this, now he had to go through Samaria. No, he didn't. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't have to go through Samaria. No good Jew went through Samaria. No good rabbi went through Samaria. No morally upstanding Jewish person would go interact with mudbloods, right? Nobody's gonna do that with the Samaritan. You don't have to go through, but Jesus did. Jesus did have to go through because he had an appointment with that woman because he purposefully and intentionally saw that woman and wanted to meet her there at noon on that day. He made sure that he was alone in the middle of the day so that he could speak to the one woman that no one else wanted anything to do with. He pursued her specifically, a non-Jewish person who was outside of what was normal and acceptable. Now, it's interesting when you compare what happens with this woman in John chapter four with what happened with the guy named Nicodemus in John chapter three. We saw that story a couple of weeks ago, right? And so uh, Nicodemus in John chapter three is an insider. He's a teacher of Israel. He's in the Jewish religion. He's morally upstanding. He's everything that you would wanna be. He is wealthy. He's on the top of social society, all of those things. And what's interesting there is that the text tells us that Nicodemus had to go to Jesus. Now, Jesus will speak with anybody and his offer of living water and life is available to every single person. We saw that, right? His scope is, his global mission is multi-ethnic. It's for everyone. But often people that are on the top of society, insiders, they have to come to Jesus. But what does Jesus do for the outsider? He strategically goes after her. He pursues the outsider, this woman, this non-Jewish, non-local, out-of-the-way woman. He had to go through Samaria. He made it a point planned it. He was strategic with when and where and who and how all of this went down. Without a plan and without some strategy, this just isn't going to happen. Right? You know this, um, we're about to do spring break, right? Spring break is coming up for those of you that have kids and you have families, or even for those of you that are like uh, in the Midwest during the winter and you're like, it's time to go. It's just time. We just got to go somewhere, somewhere warm. You know this about when you travel and you do vacations is that it's not ideal to just be like, I think I'm gonna go on vacation tomorrow and then just leave, right? That doesn't happen. What, what do you gotta do? Weeks, maybe months in advance, you have to make reservations. You have to do a vacation or a PTO request with your employer. You gotta figure out where you're gonna stay, where you're gonna lodge, the activities that you're gonna do. You have to be strategic in planning all of those things so you can get the best spot and it works out the way you want it to work out. You just have to be strategic with it. And the same thing is true here. We've gotta have a plan. Jesus is showing us here that global missions, 
more than just our local context, is vital and must be pursued purposefully and intentionally. We are called to pursue people strategically and purposefully. And then secondly, we're called to do this across barriers. We need to cross barriers to get to people. Um, When we step back from the story and we just start to think about all of the barriers that Jesus crossed to reach this woman, it's really pretty incredible. So think with me just for a second about all the barriers that Jesus crosses here. He crossed, first of all, a gender barrier, right? He's a male, she's a female. In his culture, you just don't even talk to women in public. You know, that's just the way that it was in the first century. Jesus is like, I don't care about that. I'm, I'm, I'm pursuing her. He crosses a racial barrier, right? She's a Samaritan that Jews don't have anything to do with. He's a Jew. And he's like, I don't care about that. I'll cross that barrier as well. We could also put here a cultural barrier. There was a lot of cultural differences between the two of them. He crossed a moral barrier. He's moral. She's immoral. I don't want, I don't want to associate with somebody like that. Crosses that barrier. The religions were different. There were some similarities that they had for sure, but there was enough differences. That's part of their conversation. Uh, Our Samaritans say that we should worship here. You Jews worship only in Jerusalem. I mean, she even calls that out. He crosses that barrier. There's a geographical barrier. He goes where no one else wants to go, right? No one else would go there. He has to go through Samaria. He crosses all of these barriers purposefully to reach this unreached woman. It wasn't easy. It wasn't conventional. And quite frankly, no one else in history was doing it. You can see how crazy what Jesus is doing here, how crazy it comes across to people. You you notice first how surprised the woman is by what Jesus is doing. Like, who are you? Look at verse nine. The Samaritan woman said to him, he asked her for a drink of water. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then John's note, because he's very precise, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, I know sometimes reading these stories, you're like, oh yeah, that's not nice. Jews don't associate with Samaritans. But could you imagine right now having a conversation with someone and in the midst of your conversation, let's just call it a family member. So you're, fa- you're having this conversation with your family member and your family member says, oh yeah, we don't associate with those people. We don't like those people. We don't have anything to do with them. We avoid those people. Your eyes would probably kind of get like this and you'd be like, you're, you're, you're evil. Like that's not acceptable. You don't... We, Really? There's like a group of people that you would, you're just gonna, you're gonna go ahead and say that you don't associate with those people. Are you serious? In the day that we live in, you don't understand like how, how, how wrong that is. But in this day, every single person in Jewish culture accepted that. We don't associate with those people. And so Jesus crosses that barrier, right? He's willing to step into that. And the woman is so surprised by it. Then his followers, after he and the woman have the conversation in verse 27, his disciples return with food. And look at what it says. They were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But nobody asked, what do you want? Or or why are you talking with her? You can imagine how this went down. The disciples come back and it's Jesus after all. So they're like, what is he talking to her for? Why is he talking to a woman? Does he know what she's like? Does he know who she is? I mean, we don't know all of her history, but we know enough about why she would be coming to the well all by herself with no friends. She's an immoral woman. What is he doing? But they're not gonna say it to Jesus. They're just completely surprised that he would break down all of these barriers. But Jesus shows us here, this is his mission. A barrier crossing purposeful pursuit of people. That takes sacrifice. It takes hard work. It takes intentionality. It takes a willingness to step out and to be misunderstood because you have to leave the familiar. You have to leave what you know. You have to leave the conventional to cross barriers, geographic barriers, language barriers, social barriers. So get this, uh, follower of Jesus. One of the ways that you and I can discern whether or not we are on board with Jesus's mission One way we can discern whether or not we are engaged with the mission and the heart of Jesus is to ask whether or not there is any barrier crossing going on in our lives. You know, is is all of my life built around what is comfortable, familiar, and easy? And is the primary pursuit of my life comfort? People that look like me, talk like me, act like me, people that are easy for me to just easily connect with. Or is there some level of barrier crossing going on? One of the primary ways that we define global missions and a missionary is someone who crosses barriers and borders to share Jesus with people. Now, you maybe heard uh, people say to you before, in, in one sense, all of us are missionaries, 
And in one sense, that is true, that in your school and in your work and your neighborhood, we're all called to be missionaries in one sense, to share Jesus with people for sure. But there's another sense in which there's a special way that we use this term missionary. And here at North Point, the primary way we use the term missionary is someone who is crossing geographic and cultural and language barriers overseas to bring the gospel to people in a special way. We're all called to be involved in that. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But that's what it means to be a missionary, crossing borders, crossing barriers. And then lastly, through relationships and words through relationships and words. We see this last part as Jesus shows respect and gentleness to this woman, um, that he would defy cultural norms to get to her, that he would be willing to be misunderstood to get to her, um, to be able to show her love. But then as they interact, you notice something about their interaction that he doesn't just let her off the hook. He's not like, oh, just believe whatever you wanna believe, just think whatever you wanna think. There is a world views that collide in the conversation that Jesus has with her. He actually confronts her with the truth that she has been searching for love in all the wrong places to quote a song, right? That has been what her life has been. That's what she's been searching for. And I think the reason that he points out to her that, honey, you've had five husbands and the man you're with now is not your husband. And she had to be saying like, how do you know that? How do you know that that's true? In fact, we know that she's surprised by that because she's like, I perceive that you're a prophet. Yeah, do you, do you think so, right? She's kind of trying to change, she's trying to change the subject. Let's not talk about me. And then she changes the subject to talk about worship, you know, some political, cultural kind of thing that's going on. Why does Jesus do this? Why does he cut her that way? You've had five husbands, the man you're with now is not your husband. Well, because sometimes to get to the truth, we have to confront our past. Sometimes to get to the truth, we have to be honest with who we are with what we've done, with where we've been. Do you know what Jesus is saying to her? He's not trying to hurt her. He's trying to say to you, to, to this woman, I know you all the way down. I know who you are. I know where you've been. I know what you've done. And I'm still talking to you. And I'm still offering you living water. In fact, I'm the only one that can provide what you've been looking for. Hope and meaning and true satisfaction in life. Jesus' approach with this woman is relational and truthful. He speaks to her, but he confronts her past to show her a better way. He speaks words of love and truth to her. Look, Christianity's method, our method is love. It's relational and it's gracious. It is not colonial. It is not dominating. It is not conquering. It is love. It is persuasive love. Love that seeks to persuade people. Love with truth. We try to convince we allow people to make their own decision, but man, we work hard to understand them, to know their struggles, to know what they are wrestling with, to show kindness and to offer them hope. We intentionally pursue people across barriers through relationships and words. And it is this truth speaking love that leads the woman to believe in Jesus. So much so that she becomes a witness for Jesus to her entire town. Check out verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Now, the people in the town would have known a bit about this woman. So when she comes in saying, he told me everything I ever did, they're like, oh, really? Really? Wow. We got to go out and we got to see, we got to see him. We got to see him. Verse 30, they came out of the town and they made their way towards him. Then Jesus has an interaction with his disciples and we get a summary of the story in verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, get this, because of the woman's words, because of the woman's testimony, her story, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them and he stayed two days. And because of his words now, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Relationship with words, a testimony, a story of life change, a story of truth. It's loving and it's persuasive. Now look, you know that there are some people that would hear what we're talking about today and they would tell us that global missions and even local missions and evangelism is wrong. It's wrong for you to try to persuade someone of your beliefs. It's wrong for you to try to change someone else's beliefs. Um, you shouldn't force your beliefs on other people. You shouldn't do evangelism. 
And you certainly shouldn't destroy other people's culture or act like your version of religion is better than someone else's. Now, let's be honest. Let's be honest with ourselves. Some of that is fair criticism. It is. There is a problem when Western forms of Christianity try to dominate and end up destroying other cultures. And this has happened in history. This has happened through the Crusades. Uh, this has happened through some of the, what we would call the missionary movement of the 1800s and the 1900s. That has happened and it's wicked and it's wrong and we can own that. But when Christians are driven by Jesus to be relational and loving, to be respectful of people, to value them and their culture, to uphold the dignity of all people. And they combine that love with truth speaking, confronting wrongs and showing that Jesus provides true life. When the method is loving persuasion, then we can avoid the errors of the past, errors of domination and control. And instead we can help people to come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Look, if Jesus is God, and if this word is true, and if you truly believe this, don't you want as many people as possible to get in on that? Don't you think it's worth getting to know them and being willing to step out of your comfort zone a little bit and willing to risk a little bit in order to share with them and say, well, I want you to have this relationship with God that I have. I want you to know God. That's what Global Missions is. It's just the saying we want as many people as possible to come into a relationship with God, to find living water. You know, it's actually the most unloving thing that we could do to not tell people. You ever thought about that? Do you know um, the, uh, the magic duo Penn and Teller? Do you know these guys? There's the one big tall guy and then the smaller guy and the big tall guy talks all the time and the small guy just helps do the magic tricks. They have a little bit of comedy that goes with it too. Well, Penn Jillette is the big guy that talks and he's an atheist. A number of years ago, he released this video and in the video, he said this. He said, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize. His fuller quote went like this. He said, I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. He's an atheist, remember? I don't respect that at all. He says, if you believe there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, and atheists who think people shouldn't proselytize and who say, just leave me alone and keep your religion to yourself, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that truck was bearing down on you, there was a certain point where I tackle you, right? And this is more important than that. That's pretty profound from the mouth of an atheist. Look, as long as we approach people with love and respect and persuasion, it's not only okay, it's how we are called to love people. It's what Jesus came to do and what he modeled for us. That's his mission. We're called to pursue people across barriers through relationships and words. That's what Global Missions is. And it's what we wanna be fully engaged in. I wanna take the rest of our time that I have this morning to tell you how North Point is specifically seeking to do this. You know, there's a lot of churches uh, throughout the world and there's a lot of different methods and ways that these churches use to, to try to fulfill their call to the global mission that Jesus has for them. And um, there's a, a lot of different ways that you could do this. Um, and we wanna honor and respect the ways that different churches are doing this. And we just acknowledge there isn't just one way to do this. But in order, I think, to be strategic and most effective, each church needs to hone in on how they sense God wants them to do this. And, and some churches and some ministries, they sort of have what I might call a, um, a shotgun approach to it. And they say, we've got 100 missionaries or we support 150 missionaries and we just take the shotgun and we load it up and we just blow as many little BBs out and we hope we hit a target somewhere by just doing a ton and a, uh, just tons of this. And then there's other churches like ours who say, you know what, we're gonna take a rifle shot approach. This is our target. This is what we feel God has called us to through prayer and studying and looking to him. And we're gonna shoot a rifle and this is the target we're going for. This is what we want to do. And so here's North Point's rifle shot global mission. Our global mission is to plant churches among people groups that are the least reached for Christ, focusing on Northern Africa, the Middle East and Asia. We're going after planning churches among unreached P 
people groups. And you see in this mission that it's another way of us really extending the mission of North Point Church. Our mission here as a church is to cultivate communities of grace and truth, communities, multiple communities, multiple churches filled with the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ. But this global mission takes that and it just makes it a little bit more specific. We say this, we're, we're gonna pursue unreached people groups, the least reached people in the world which means that we will have language and culture and geographic barriers to cross in order to get to unreached peoples. This means a lot of time, a lot of preparation, a lot of education and hard work. Among these people, we wanna plant churches, groups of people that have trusted in Jesus Christ and live in community with one another because Christianity is meant to be relational. I mean, this is the essence of what God does. He created us. He wants a relationship with us. He puts us in relationships with each other, with the Holy Spirit in us. He creates a church so that we can continue to grow in our relationship with him. And so our strategy is church focused. It's to plant churches among unreached peoples in a relational way. And in order to reach folks in these places, we have to send missionaries then who know the native language, the native culture, and the native customs of the people that they are going to. And we've targeted some areas of greatest need in the world in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Many of these places that we are targeting are what we would call, or what are called closed countries, meaning they don't want Christians there. They don't think that you should be there. And so in order to be there, you have to develop a business, a legitimate business that's for the good of the community that you're in, that cares for and loves people and is for the community flourishing and allows you to be there to share your faith with them. Now look, when we say that this is our mission, this is our rifle shot mission, this doesn't mean that there aren't other parts of the world that are important. It doesn't mean that there are not other uh, methods that are good like missionary schools, or youth ministry, or sex trafficking, or orphanages, or radio ministry. Um, those could be things that are used to do this mission even, and these are things that other churches and ministries are involved in, but hear me carefully, those are not our strategic focus. They're not our rifle shot as a church. Unreached peoples, that's our strategic focus. Unreached peoples are people that have no Bibles, no believers, and no churches. There are areas and parts of the world where, where, where most of the people have never even heard the name of Jesus before, which is crazy, isn't it? Living in the year 2021, there are still millions, actually billions of people that have never even heard the name of Jesus Christ. You might say, well, like, how significant is that? Like, how many people are like that? Is this really a big deal? Is this a big problem? What is estimated that there's over 6,000 people groups in the world today that are unreached peoples representing 3.1 billion people or nearly 40% of the world's population that are unreached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, now get this, when you combine that with the fact that less than 10% of missionaries today go to unreached peoples and less than 1% of all missionary giving goes to these unreached peoples, it just will blow your mind. That means that 90% of missionaries and 99% of financial giving goes to places that already have the gospel, that have radio ministry, that have churches, that have Bible colleges, that have seminaries, that have pastors, that have just most of the resources of the world. Do you see why this is our strategic focus? Jesus went to a woman that no one else wanted anything to do with in an unreached part of the world that no one would have ever gone to. And he purposefully pursued her, crossing all kinds of barriers to bring her the truth. We wanna do that for the unreached peoples of the world, specifically in a few targeted places in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Now, this task will take time and concerted effort. Uh, we believe it'll take a total of 10 to 20 years to see a healthy church planted in these places. So we're in this for the long haul. Here's some good news. We have 22 missionaries that North Point Church supports, and among those 22 missionaries or missionary units, 30% of them have already learned one foreign language, the trade language of the country they're going to. They are in the process of learning a secondary language, which would be like the tribal language or what we would call the heart language of the people. It's a language that they really understand and process life and talk to each other in. It's how they understand worldview issues in that language. And they have begun to start a business so they can have a legitimate presence in that community. Now, for a number of our missionaries, they're on the front end of this process, one, two, three years into it, and they need us to come alongside of them, which is our role. How can we do that? How can we be a part of this global mission that Jesus is doing? 
Well, part of that is just uh, doing what we're doing here today, letting me talk to you about this. I know this message is a little different than the normal messages I give. It's more of a teaching message about Jesus's global mission and what he's calling us to. But this is a part of you being involved in that global mission by learning and understanding what is the strategy? Why are we doing that? What is the need that is out there and how can I be involved? Uh, Secondly, for some of you, especially the younger that you are, God may be prompting in you a desire to say, maybe I should do that. You know, maybe I should be involved in that. This isn't for everyone. Not everyone should do this for sure to become a missionary like we're talking about today. But maybe you could ask in your heart and in your mind, instead of doing our American thing that we do, um, you know, what do you wanna do when you grow up? What do you wanna be when you grow up? Which is good. I have that conversation with my girls all the time. Well, I have that question and then I have this question. What do you think God wants you to do? How do you think he's wired you? How do you think he wants you to impact his kingdom long-term in the future? And so if you're younger, maybe you're asking this question and, and God starts saying to you, maybe you should look into this missions thing. Maybe you should be interested in that. And if that's you, talk to me. Talk to Barry, our, our missions pastor that's here at the church. He's one of the top experts in the Midwest on Asian and Chinese culture. You should talk to him. You should get to know him and, and, and talk with him about that and maybe explore whether or not God might have you go and be a missionary. It's not for everyone but it's for some of you. For all of us, this is what we can do. We can pray, give, and encourage. Three simple things. Every single follower of Jesus can pray, give, and encourage. By pray, I mean uh, learn about God's mission here. Uh, Learn and get to know some missionaries. Get on their email list, pray for them. Now, it might seem daunting to you to be like 22 missionaries, I gotta do all 22. I'm just gonna tell you, no, you don't, you don't. But could you do one? Could you do one missionary or two missionary or or one of our teams? We have some teams of missionaries as well and get to know them, get on their email list, pray for them and then give. It starts with you regularly giving here at North Point Church. A significant portion of our budget every year goes to global missions. But then maybe you could individually support a missionary as well from our church that you could get more connected with. You could start supporting a compassion child in Indonesia to get to know that culture and and to grow your heart for God's global mission. And then lastly, you can encourage. As you get to know a missionary or two, you can email them and and pray for them. Maybe send them a care package. It would surprise you to to, to know how little communication missionaries when they leave the United States get from churches and church people in the US. And I don't know if you could imagine yourself a minute moving to a completely different culture away from the States and to barely ever hear from any other followers of Jesus, like in your home church and where you're from. So it's a simple thing, a simple email, a simple, a simple text, just getting to know them. They send you their prayer letter and you pray for that and then you delete it and then they'll send you another one and you pray for that next one when that comes out. We can do this. We can pray, we can give, we can encourage them. And with God's help in the next 10 to 20 years, we will begin to see some churches planted among unreached peoples in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. And we will celebrate how God is using us in his global mission. Would you pray with me?